Hello and welcome to the Slow Living Summit, the future of farm and food entrepreneurship. I'm Jim Verzino. I'm entrepreneur in residence of Wyndham Grows and we co-sponsor with Strolling of the Heifers, the Slow Living Summit. And we're here today with the founders and the starters of the Slow Living Summit and Strolling of the Heifers. So Orly Munzing and Kathy Berry both played a major role in the beginning of the Slow Living Summit. And Orly, of course, is the executive director and founder of Strolling of the Heifers. So Orly, can you give us some background on how the Slow Living Summit began and how it fits into the picture of Strolling of the Heifers? Sure. Uh, well, it's, this is our 18th year of the Strolling of the Heifers. And it's the eighth year of the Slow Living Summit, uh, which we're very excited about. Uh, we've always had some sort of a summit, um, the serious side of the strolling of the heifers from day one. But, oh, about eight, nine years ago, um, I was lucky enough to meet Woody Tash, the founder of Slow Money. Okay. And uh, convinced him to come and do a summit this was about nine years ago, um, for the serious side as a kickoff to the strolling of the heifers. And he did. And he brought this amazing panel with him. Kathy Berry was one of the panelists. And they talked about the concept of slow money. And I was so excited. And sitting next to me were other excited people. Packed room at World Learning. Um, you couldn't even move. And we all felt great about it, but we just didn't know what can we do as individuals. Um, so thinking about that and feeling, you know, really moved by the, um, did you hear that? Moved by <laughs> the um, whole Slow Living Summit. Um, and then hearing Kathy Berry, who was one of the panelists, and. Kathy, I, if I'm correct, I walked up to her after her uh, presentation and said, we got to talk. <laughs> and when Harley says we got to talk, you got to talk. <sighs> right. Her presentation was amazing. And it really brought down the concept in much more manageable pieces. And basically, Kathy spoke about community and how businesses need to give back to the community and how individuals need to give back to the community. And it really touched me because all of us kind of do that, but I wasn't able to articulate it. And many of us, unfortunately, living in a fast lane, fast world, uh, we learn to extract from the community versus giving back. And that's the whole purpose of the Slow Living Summit. So um, Kathy was dear enough to who also got excited about it, ended up moving here uh, from New Hampshire to help me get this off the ground. And I We had probably, meetings, weekly meetings. For more the than, first, sometimes uh, more than weekly. For the, first, for the first couple of years. So you actually moved to Brattleboro from wherever you were to help get the Slow Living Summit off the ground? Yeah, the commute was just, I was coming driving over here once a week. So it just wow. made sense to just move here. So that's a big Because it was uh, really, well, it's really important we slow down. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the birth of the Soul Living Summit. And we've had different topics each year. Uh, we also um, did the business planning competition. Our piece was the farm food business planning competition. And uh, we partners with BDCC that did the traditional. And um, we did that for about eight years. And each year we would hear, as we were doing the Slow Living Summit, we would hear from um, participants and finalists that the nice uh, prizes we had, monetary prizes, were wonderful. However, the big takeaway from, for them was all the great consultation and preparation that they had for the business planning competition. And they were very sad when the competition was over. Uh, we kept really good friends with many of those people who have actually succeeded um, from those business planning competition like Big Picture Farm and others. Um, but we took to heart what they said. And again, I approached Kathy um, and um, talked about to other um, leaders in our community and we developed Wyndham Growth. And um, the rest is history. And so the Slow Living Summit has kind of um, taken a different path and has become 
the conference of our Wyndham Grows, which scales up small farm food businesses. Yeah, it, it, it feels to me like the conference is really, you know, it's, it's in the title, I think, Farm and Food Entrepreneurship. And that really is the focus. But just as importantly in the title and in what we do at the conference is about conscious food entrepreneurship. So not just having a business and starting a business that makes money, but also gives back to the community and does good for the community around it. So I think that's what makes it interesting. And Kathy, you're going to be speaking or you're going to be leading panels what kind of things are your panels going to be about that entrepreneurs and other investors might be interested to hear about? I think that one of the things that I've learned as an investor, because of course I thought I could invest in local businesses and I'd show everyone how easy it was, I discovered how difficult it was. And so what I really have come to realize is that you really need to build a community around your business. And your business has to be serving the community because in a way it's a give back you know you they're supporting you and you're supporting them and that means if you get in trouble you have a lot of people who want to keep you in business and as an entrepreneur and an investor it's building a team that is going to keep this company going because we have this really bizarre idea that each individual is capable of doing anything and everything. And I think those of us who have gray hair have, and have tried this, have discovered that the team effort, the collaborative effort where everybody's on the same page makes a lot more sense. Like how do we build a team? And this is not just for entrepreneurs. This is for foundations. This is for any investor, a nonprofit, I don't care what your, what your business is, whether it's a nonprofit or for-profit, whether you're an investor, a fund, to make this company successful and to make sure that it operates as the, what the, does what the community needs, we need to build that team effort and we need to communicate about the goals of this company and also what our needs are. Eventually, investors need to get their money back. Right. And wouldn't, wouldn't it be better if the entrepreneur totally owned the company? Meaning, like, there are a lot of goals out there that can be aligned if you have the right lawyers, the right accountants, so that you embed those goals in the company from the very beginning. Yeah, and I think that's something really interesting about a lot of the companies that are coming through Wyndham Grows and a lot of other socially conscious companies in the food industry and outside of the food industry now, and the different funding models that help them come together. Can you tell us the story of why well, I know one of the companies you invested in and worked with was Vermont Smoke and Cure? Can you tell us kind of the story behind that and sort of how, and what parts of it kind of fit into this model that we're talking about? Well, actually, Vermont Smoke and Cure was really informative for me because I ended up owning it. And I had no idea what a meat processing plant was. <laughs> but Ouch. Yes. But fortunately, I had this amazing worker who I inherited with the company um, at Chris Bailey. And so between the two of us, we kind of worked on mission and bottom line. And that balance of creating mission and bottom line, you know, what was our role in the community? Vermont Smoke and Care donated to virtually everything. I mean, we had meat sticks and pepperoni everywhere because that's what we could give back. We couldn't give back cash. Mm. And how the, when we had to, when we moved into our new plant, it was very difficult because we went from a 3,000 square foot facility to an 18,000 square foot facility, which everyone says can't be done and actually have a successful company. Can't, can't be done because 18,000 is too big for that the, kind of the, a place? The overhead when you go from 3,000 to 18,000, you have to have enough product to mm. get the cash flow in so you can pay the overhead. And so we were very fortunate that Heinsberg wanted us there and we had Vita money, we had foundation money, we had a lot of mission-related investors um, and even our landlord um, helped getting us into that place, you know, with loans. And it was a very creative, we have a business plan. We actually wrote it up if anyone wants to see it. It was complex, far more complex than the time we have right here. But it was truly a community that got Vermont Smoke and Care into the Heinsberg plant. 
without each member of the community, you know, politically, the investors, the employees, it, it took all of that to get us in that plant and where we are right now. So it's kind of a good, kind of a good example of community because we had, it sounds to me, if I'm hearing it correctly, the state was involved at some level by giving loans. The local community was involved either through the landlord or the development credit corporation exactly. or both. Then there were foundation investors, which maybe, I don't know how that was going, whether it needed its money back quickly or never at all. And then there were No, they were real investors. investors. Yeah, no, the okay. foundation, this was, this was part of their endowment, so it was not a grant. Okay, so they it needed the money back. It was actually an investment, okay. exactly. But, but it was private investment, it was public investment, it was local community coming together, it was all those pieces. So that's an right. example of kind of Right, they, and, and credit line from the bank. So I mean, <laughs> right. we had a long list of helpers. Yeah. So you've got a couple of other people on the panels that you're working with. Um, any, any thoughts on, can you either tell us who they are or maybe a story from one of their pieces of work or do you not know that stuff yet? Um, well, we have Fair Food Project, which oh, has okay. been, we have, you know, Fair Food Fund has been involved in many local business deals in Vermont. Mm -hmm. You know, they typically lend money. Um, we have Nate Berry, my brother, um, who's executive director of the Sandy River Foundation, which has also granted and invested in uh, New England. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Fair Food Fund is really interesting, actually, because they're, all the things we're talking about here is really what they invest in in various ways, exactly. right? Sometimes they give loans, they will actually be an investor a sub that basically gives to other investors that invest in mission critical companies. Mm -hmm. um, so Fair Food Fund does a lot of interesting things and, and they're not just a fund, right? There's the Fair Food Network, which exactly. does other work around sustainable agriculture and sustainable farming and good food business, basically. And right? we'll also have Sam Buckley, who many of the Vermonters know from the Vermont Community Loan Fund and he's now with Vita. Oh, okay. So Sam will bring us not only um, community loan fund experience, but he will be bringing us um, info on, you know, how VITA works. And VITA, for those of you who don't know, is the Vermont Economic Development Authority. And they are awesome. They do loans to companies and really help them get the equipment and get themselves off the ground. Right. And also the, where he was before that, the Vermont Community Loan Fund is also wonderful because they do that kind of work but at a smaller scale, right? So the Community I, yeah. Loan Fund will loan to people that maybe don't have as much collateral. They're basically a commercial bank can't go, won't exactly. loan to, right, at a, at a small level. Well, when I say small, I mean, that could be up to $50,000, but I've heard of Community Loan Fund loans as low as $1,000. Like, exactly. There was a high school, the one I love is there was a high school girl who wanted to start a photography business, and she literally got a loan from Vermont Community Loan Fund for something like $1,200 to get the photography equipment. And it was like a two-year loan. She paid it all back in six or nine months. But the Community Loan Fund does amazing things. And they're a great example. And actually, they're going to be at the, at the conference as well. Exactly. And investor, you know, that's another way for investors to invest in the community is to invest through the Community Loan Fund. Right. Right. So, that's right. Because investors can invest in the Community Loan Fund, right? Exactly. So they can actually and get their money back. Meaning they're, it's not a donation, it's actually an investment. Yes. You know, not on like a CD, except that it's going, you know, going to be used in the community. So a lot of the people we're talking about and who were involved, are typically involved, will be at a conference, at one of the breakouts at right. the conference. Yes. I mean, one of the great things I think about the Slow Living Summit and kind of what makes it slow is... Literally any person can talk to any other person and there are people there that are CEOs and investors and there are people there that have never, you know, yet started a business and are just thinking about it. And everything in between and anybody can talk to anybody else because it's so accessible. And the other person who, who another person who's going to be on my panel yeah. will be Eli Moulton of the Moulton Group. And I have worked with Eli really since the Farmer's Diner. And... So tell us about the Farmer's Diner. Yeah, what's the Farmer's Diner? Um, the Farmer's Diner is how I ended up with Vermont Smoke and Cure. So that's a whole, that's another long session. But um, when I couldn't fund the diner, I was going to. What year was that? 2006, I think. Yeah. 
And it was in was the New York Times, a huge spread in the New York Times. It was one of the first establishments. Right, right. I remember reading about that. I didn't even know you at that time. And it was very difficult, I mean, trying to source food from farmers. And, you know, how do we make sure that the entrepreneurs don't fail? You know, in that case, the entrepreneur couldn't keep track of all the moving pieces. Mm. There are too many moving pieces. Mm. You know, how do you educate the farmer to get the food in the restaurant? Back then, that was a huge deal. So this is really one of the original before it was even a term. Right, right. that was 2000. This was one of the original farm-to-table yep. restaurants, right. basically. That was back in 2000. Wow. Once again, you know, building that community to support so that when times got tough, you can draw in other expertise, and, which is the other thing, learning to ask for help. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah, because most people aren't used to doing that. Um, Orly, I do want to go back to you for just one moment uh, mm -hmm. before we finish. Could you tell the viewers about Charles Eisenstein and Chuck Collins and Philip Ackerman, at least the keynote speakers at the, at the summit? Actually, um, I don't know how much time we have, but I think the viewers can definitely go to um, slowlivingsummit.org and read all about them. They're amazing. Um, they're world renowned. In fact, uh, Charles Eisenstein, um, um, Ofer Winfrey did a whole show interviewing him uh, this past summer, which I couldn't believe. And Charles has become a friend of the Slow Living Summit. Um, and uh, this is his second time coming. Uh, by the way, all the speakers at the Slow Living Summit um, volunteer their time, which is amazing. They're all putting a lot of time. They want to help others. They're giving back to the community. Um, and also what I wanted to say about uh, the Slow Living Summit is that the registration is open. Uh, we're filling up. And we want everyone to attend the conference. So it's a sliding scale. When you go to the registration, you can choose the price you want to pay. Um, and uh, no questions asked. If there's even hardship with that, all you need to do is call us and we'll find a little bit of volunteering time for you. Uh, because we want anyone who has an idea or a thought of becoming an entrepreneur, especially in the farm and food uh, sector, uh, they should be attending this um, Slow Living Summit, which is actually Thursday, May 31st, and June 1st, the Friday. And then when the uh, Slow Living Summit is over, guess what? The doors open and the street is rocking with an agriculture <laughs> Mardi Gras of the 18th strolling of the Heifers uh, Street Festival. So we look forward to seeing everyone. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Orly, and thank you, Kathy. Thanks, Jim. Okay, I'm here now speaking more about the Slow Living Summit, May 31st and June 1st the future of farm and food entrepreneurship. And you can register for the summit, by the way, by going to slowlivingsummit.org. I'm here now with Stephen Dotson, the manager of the Slow Living Summit, and Andrew Lockney from Tapaloo Guild. So, Stephen, I think you've been really making the arrangements with Andrew about his work at the summit. I haven't had a lot of interaction mm -hmm. there, so maybe if you could get us started on sure how this all fits together with the summit. I've had the pleasure of talking to so many interesting farmers and academics and scientists and Andy's uh, one of the local folks that we've uh, had join our, our conference this year. Andy's farm is in Guilford, Vermont. And Andy, I just would welcome you to share a little bit about what you do and how you ended up uh, part of the Slow Living Summit. Sure. Well, my uh, partner and I started this farm two years ago. So this is our third season and um, you know, we're in a really incredible area of vegetable market growers. Um, and so we've really been trying to find our niche. Um, we're really emphasizing a community aspect um, that's part of our name, Tapalu Guilds, you know, an association of other farmers or craftspeople. And also, um, you know, I have a background in permaculture. And so plant guilds are a common thing, looking for these plants um, that work well together, you know, companion planting and um, regenerative approaches in farming. Um, and so prior to um, last season, uh, I was approached by a friend, a musician friend, um, who asked if I had heard about hemp and CBD oil. And um, I hadn't at that point, but um, you know, did some due diligence, a little research, and it uh, wound up being a very compelling thing. And so I decided that I would do a little experimental crop with that last year. And um, you know, since then, it's it's proven that it could 
you know, potentially be a really um, viable uh, crop for our farm. And so I think that's how um, I got involved with the Slow Living Summit, um, with this mm -hmm. future of farming and, and food entrepreneurship is, um, you know, what are some things that can help drive farms? And, um, you know, we're looking at hemp and also um, cut flowers. So really flowers in general, either yep. in the yep. form of the hemp flower buds or uh, cut flowers for arrangements. Very cool. Yes, and I, you're part of an emerging industry or re-emerging industry, something that used to be part of America's culture since constitutional days, right? So it's very exciting to have you in that discussion. Can you speak a little bit more about uh, the panel that you're a part of and who else is going to be part of that discussion? I think it's called the Future Methods to Farming. Right. Right, which is kind of interesting to me because there are some really high-tech um, approaches. Um, I think uh, Series Greens, Mm -hmm. And um, and what does series greens do? It's um, an indoor like um, an indoor farm where vertical they grow vertical farming. Vertical, vertical farming, farming. Okay. right? Mm -hmm. And also um, there was a freight freight farms freight which farms. is similar uh, containers like that could just right. deliver shipping it. containers that actually you could just deliver a farm exactly forty yep. foot by eight foot take it anywhere you want it to go and just plop it down right it's quite remarkable all you need is power it's yeah quite, well and water only a little bit of water <laughs> but you need those things anyway you know right yeah. right. Um, yeah, so um, I don't know exactly, you know, so yeah. there, there was that approach and then there was also this idea of, um, you know, outdoor growing in the soil and where is the marriage between kind of high tech and low tech and what's a responsible mm -hmm. use of, of, you know, these technologies and um, t to produce. I think one other person on that panel, they're doing a, um, they've got a, a farm and they're doing protein. They're doing a bu bugs of some sort, right? I did. I saw, I saw. I don't know if they're on that panel, but I saw yeah. that there is a bug farm. It's somewhere. a cricket farm. I cricket believe. farm. That's yes. it. Yes, and, it and is, it's making, a different panel, but yes, that's a different panel. Okay, yeah, and they're making yep. pro protein powder essentially right. out of uh, or protein flour out of crickets that then can be substituted for flour. So that's pretty interesting stuff. Yeah. So can I go back to the hemp and the CBD for a second? Mm -hmm. So, so do you grow hemp and then does it get turned into CBD oil? Like what? Is, what is the actual process where it becomes goes from something that grows in the ground to a consumed good. Yeah, so um, I have a business, an off-farm business partner, um, okay. and he and I just launched an LLC called Bravo Botanicals um, okay. a couple weeks ago. And so basically we harvested it, cured it, you know, let it, let it dry, so it was, you know. So you grow some kind of hemp that is high legal CBD, to grow? Uh, yes, exactly. Okay, uh, so high, you know, we're, it's below a 0.3% So this THC. is all legal? This is all legal. Yep. Okay. Yep. Um, For our viewers. It, yes. And if you walked out to look at it, though, you might not know that because it's grown. It looks the same. It looks the same as marijuana because um, with, you know, it's, it's unlike femp or hemp fiber where you're trying to get the long stalks for the long things. This mm, you're, okay. you're going for the bushy flower buds. Okay. Um, but yeah, it's, it's high in C, you know, selected a variety, high in CBD, and low in THC. Um, mm -hmm. When that was ready to harvest, we did that. We cured it in my barn. And then we experiment a little bit with some home infusions, but then ultimately wound up taking it up to a, um, a, an extraction lab in Waterbury, Vermont, hmm. um, where they used a, a CO2 extraction, like a high pressure extraction to pull the oils out of the, um, the buds. And then they deliver that back to us. That's a, a shelf ready product right there, hmm. which we've been bottling up in tincture bottles and have it in a couple of retail outlets and also um, doing some of our own infusions now with this very clean, pure, potent oil. So, and what does one do with CBD oil? I mean, I've heard of it in natural, like health pills and things like that. What, what does one do with CBD oil? Well, um, I ingest it every day, um, just kind of as a, um, almost as like a- Supplement? A supplement, like a dietary yep. supplement, a wellness supplement. And okay. I find that it kind of evens things out a little bit. Okay. Um, you know, at this time of year, especially, which is, uh, I call it mayhem on the farm. <laughs> um, there's so many things to do. I can start to get that right. up, up in the throat. And I find that the, the CBD okay. kind of helps even that mm -hmm. out a little bit. I've heard of people having um, great success um, treating children who have seizures mm -hmm. that they don't mm -hmm. want to put on um, heavy narcotics. Um, also had a couple burns in the last couple weeks that a couple of drops of the oil um, relieve some of that pain pretty quickly. Right. So is, it, is it used in a, uh, as, a, as an ingredient in lotions and things like that as well? <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. One of okay. our products is uh, um, just a coconut oil that's infused with it that you can either take orally uh -huh. or, use, oh, okay. or use topically. Oh. Yeah. I take it every night for insomnia, believe it or not. It yeah, helps I was going to say, sleep, yeah. sleep aid too is one thing yeah. that we've discovered. And we're just kind of, you know, the, the, it's very new and the research is new, but 
most of the cases I'm hearing are first person cases um, mm -hmm. like, like Stephen and um, it's been Great. pretty powerful, the response. Great, well, well we know it's a busy season for you so we certainly appreciate you taking some time out to be here and to come to the Slow Living Summit and speak. So thank you very much for that. Yeah, you're welcome, Jim. Thanks okay, so much for Okay, we look forward to seeing you there. Thanks, Andy. Thanks, Stephen. Okay, we're back. I'm Jim Verzino. We're here today talking about the Slow Living Summit taking place May 31st and June 1st, 2018, right in downtown Brattleboro. You can sign up, by the way, by going to slowlivingsummit.org. And it's on a sliding scale, so no one's turned away, and you can choose your own price. And it's all about community. It's all about building community, and the actual title is The Future of Farm and Food Entrepreneurship. And it's really about how do we build businesses in a way that also build community at the same time, because it's something we so desperately need. And actually, I'm here today now on Skype with Hannah Flanders, a co-founder of the Kearsarge Food Hub. Hi, Hannah. How you doing? Hi, I'm great, Jim. Cool. So, <laughs> as I said, the Slow Living Summit this year really is about community and business. So, can you give us some background first where the Kearsarge Food Hub is and kind of how the community came together to, to actually build, a, build, build the Kearsarge Food Hub? Absolutely. So we are based in Bradford, New Hampshire, which is central New Hampshire. And the Food Hub was founded in 2014 by four or five, the number is growing, um, uh, Kearsarge graduates. And Kearsarge is the local school district that encompasses okay. seven towns in this kind of rural area. Uh, and we all came back from college and we loved where we grew up here. It's beautiful. There's lots of farms, lots of um, beautiful landscapes. And we just couldn't imagine doing the typical thing that young people tend to do these days, kind of going out and getting a job in the city. We wanted to come back to where we grew up um, and start a business to kind of reclaim our food system on a local level. So we rooted ourselves in Bradford um, and started reaching out to farmers that we knew and community folks. And um, we opened a farm stand in the summer of 2015. And it was a collaborative effort amongst the community. We had three different community members donate plots of land to us to start farming. Mm. So we started there. Uh, we had an architect donate plans for us to build our own little farm stand. Um, and we ourselves built the farm stand. And we opened for business on July 4th and uh, people came. <laughs> people were really excited to come see what the local food scene was like. I mean, we have farmers markets, of course, and CSAs and things like that, but not really a collaborative, comprehensive local food market. Um, everything from fresh seasonal produce to meat, dairy, ice cream, cheese, uh, syrup and honey and all the wonderful things that people are producing. We worked really hard to reach out to all those people and bring all their products into one space. So you mentioned the, um, you mentioned that you built, I have so many questions. You mentioned that you <laughs> built a farm stand. Yes. Is what you're talking about now with all these different products? Is there actually a store? I'm a little bit confused. Yep, that's that's right. We started with a farm stand. Uh, it was a nice, easy way, low investment. We didn't want to take out a bunch of debt. We wanted to start with what we could manage. So we started with a farm stand and um, it has since morphed into a local food market. We have uh, upgraded into a building that we're now currently renovating. It's an old inn, 10,000 square feet. Wow. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a big that's project. That's a big space. It's... A, it's a, it's on the other side of town, kind of a forgotten part of Main Street. Uh, not many businesses there, not much going on. So we, we moved from one side of town from the farm stand to the other to this old inn, and we're really working on developing not only our market to be a reliable year-round market, but a community space to kind of work on other ideas like uh, community dinners, a cafe is opening up, a, we're opening a shared-use commercial kitchen to work on more food processing and hopefully cooking classes and things like that. That. Wow, that's amazing. That's that's really incredible. One of the things we're going to be talking about actually quite a bit at the Slow Living Summit is really how does one finance a sustainable community focused business? So the first question is, you, you're from an ownership perspective, it's a co-op, correct? Uh, it's a nonprofit. It's a uh, nonprofit. Yes. So we are, you know, nobody owns it. We are a board of directors and then we have a team of officers operating, uh, doing the day to day. A lot of right. overlap there, by the way, between the officers and the board so sure. far, as it's mostly us founders working on the project. Mm -hmm. Um, so 
so that's how we operate now as okay. kind of a collective. Okay. And, yeah, yeah. And, and most people don't realize actually that a co-op, most of the time, well, all the time, a co-op technically is a for-profit business. Like when, right. when we have a, you know, the Brattleboro Food Co-op and most food co-ops, they are essentially a for-profit business that just has multiple owners, right. essentially. Yeah. So many people don't realize that. So I just wanted to clarify that as a nonprofit, you're able to probably get grants and things like that that you wouldn't be able to do as a co-op. Is that correct? Yep, that's correct. We um, aim to be financially diverse, so we do grants. Yes, we are currently working on a local food promotion program grant where we are assessing the local uh, food system in New Hampshire, specifically looking at a 30-mile radius, which is our focus um, around the town of Bradford that we operate in. Uh, we also raise money through fundraising. We raised over $30,000 through a crowdfunding campaign last summer wow. to do building renovations. It was really exciting, and that's also a great way to get the community involved because you're talking to people about what you're doing. You're asking them to obviously invest financially, but then people become invested emotionally and otherwise. Um, and we have our retail arm of the nonprofit, which is Sweet Beat Market. So we pull in money um, through the sale of local goods, but all of it is aimed to educate the public and uh, give fair prices and a more consistent market outlet for, for local farmers. Wow, that's amazing. So is Sweet Beat Market what's going to be in that 10,000 square foot space once it's renovated? It already is. Yep. Yeah, we opened the market in that space last summer. Um, the rest of the building is completely undeveloped. It was parceled out for apartments about 10 years ago. It was going to be developed into apartments. Then it was just laying dormant. That project fell through. So last summer we opened Sweet Beat Market in the building while the, there was nothing else going on in the building. And then we were slowly developing this vision for the rest of the building as kind of a community hub. Hmm. around the market. So so right now we've actually closed the market to focus on building renovations and we'll be reopening this summer. Okay. So really it is truly kind of even though technically it's a nonprofit, it truly is a community-based business. The yes. the products as much as possible seem to come from the community. The community really financed it and the community works in it. Yes. True. Wow, that's um that's that's quite remarkable. What is the, remind me again, what is the panel that you're speaking on when, so are you participating in, I should say, in the, uh, at the summit? Yeah, um, we're, we're speaking um, with Chuck Collins and we're talking about bringing money back to the local level. Okay, cool. So instead of having a corporate giant grocery store from far away, it's basically a, a grocery store that's got products from local people run by local people. Exactly. Yep. That's the goal. That's the entire goal of what we do. Uh, and we're really excited to be kind of fleshing out some of these uh, business details with with you folks at the summit. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, well, that's kind of what we specialize here for the people at Wyndham Grows, the the the, um, you know, the business accelerator part of strolling in the heifers and really kind of the producers of of the Soul Living Summit. So really be interesting for you to be able to see some of the financing options, too, because one of the great one of the great things that's going to be at the summit is really looking at lots of panels. As a matter of fact, Kathy Berry was here earlier, and lots of panels and discussion about innovative financing methods for projects like this, right? That yeah. it doesn't really fit cleanly into a nonprofit because in the end it's a, still a grocery store, right? And most grocery right. stores are for profit, but yeah. it certainly doesn't fit cleanly into a clear for profit model either. So I'm sure financing a lot of this stuff is very complex. It is very complex. We actually just received our federal uh, 501c3 status. We were back and forth between for-profit, non-profit, um, and we've ultimately landed in, in non-profit for now, but but you're right, it, it requires innovative techniques and there's no clear-cut answer. It's constant problem solving. So you were talking about when you got started, I think it was 2014, you would mm -hmm. all kind of come back from college. So were you all literally kind of just like living with your parents or just living in an apartment <laughs> and just kind of let's figure this out as we go? Um, it, it's different for all of us. Some of us were traveling in South America. Um, I myself came home and had my first child and started my family with my now husband. Um, and so we kind of all had spread out and came back together. And yeah, we, we all kind of did end up moving back in with our parents to, uh, to make it financially viable right off the start. Um, and we're just 
the the design that we've taken in, in our entrepreneurship is to not quit our day jobs right off the bat, not put in a bunch of money right off the bat, not you know start off you know in debt. We wanted to make this viable. So we live with our parents. We, we invest the money that we have personally. And otherwise we don't take out giant loans that we can't afford in the long run. So it's been a very slow, sustainable growth for us. How are you putting those, free, how are you putting those freezers in there? Those things are expensive. They are. Yeah. Right now, well, we're applying for a second grant for kitchen equipment. Okay. Um, and we just get creative. For instance, a bakery uh, that was running for 25 years in a town nearby in Hillsborough was closing down. I just happened to walk into the bakery one day and they asked me if I wanted to buy it. And I, I, they were joking, but it turns out we did want to buy it. <laughs> so nice. That's great. Started- yeah, it was fantastic. So we bought all their equipment, and and now people who who love that bakery, German John's Bakery, are coming to us, knowing that we've kind of inherited some of their things. So, it it works in many ways. Right. So uh, w- one last question, that is always interesting to talk to entrepreneurs. You started this thing with a couple other people as a farm stand, and now it sounds like it's a it's a pretty decent sized entity. Certainly a lot bigger than a farm stand. Mm-hmm. If you had to come down to one, what is your one biggest surprise in hmm. this sort of, in this, in, in this journey that you've taken over the last uh, four years? If you're hmm. gonna say like this one thing surprises me most. Well, that's a terrific question. <laughs> um, I would say the details of running a business surprised me um, because I'm a visionary kind of person. And obviously the message we have is strong and lots of people agree. And the local food movement is um, it's taking off, although having some hindrances, but really the details of selling local food and working with people, um, they're very surprising. It's a lot to work out. Working together in a group toward a shared mission is very difficult. And the interpersonal relationships must be nurtured. And I've started working with all of my best friends that I grew up with, but the most surprising thing is learning how to work together is a challenge. And it should be met as a challenge, and it's very exciting. Cool, cool, It's, it's more than just a snowball fight. That's right. (laughs) (laughs) Hannah, this has been awesome. I can't wait to see you in a couple of weeks at the Slow Living Summit. All right. Thanks so much for having me, Jim. My pleasure. Bring your friends. If you want to sign up for the Slow Living Summit, go to www.slowlivingsummit.org. I'm Jim Verzino, and we will see you next time.